Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of Pre-Post Game, also known as a pleasure here to educate, empower, protect the athletes and the family's best interests alone. Coming to you today on Sunday, June the 14th. Hope everyone is well. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm working along with the uh, former Iowa Hawkeyes and their parents, and I'm doing this live to set a couple of things straight pertaining on where we at regarding certain things. Um, I'll also be revealing the names of the um, former athletes and parents that are moving forward at this time pertaining to having their voices heard and see where that may take us. But, but in the meantime, I need to address the press conference, the stage press conference that was taking place a couple of days ago by the University of Iowa, um, headed by Kirk Ferentz. And one thing I want to say is that reality is what's going to happen and is really disappointing that um, major outlets and major um, media has not basically taken the time to really look into or address the actual parents of the athletes and the former ones, and only to hear Kirk Ferentz said that he hasn't really paid attention to what's going on or doesn't really know what's being said goes to show you that what these former athletes and parents have said is that the things that happened to them as an African-American athlete was not something that the University of Iowa and the football program seemed to care about at the least. So we're going to break down exactly a few things to help you understand how this actually worked. One, um, the fact that Brian Ferenc and Chris Doyle wasn't there standing at the press conference to speak on behalf of the actual allegations that we know to be factual that happened to these student athletes as egregious at best. We also find that the actual media that was there um, did not address certain questions when Kirk Ferenc mentioned terms as blind spot. What does the actual blind spot mean? And then when you had one young man, can't even think of his name right now, mentioned that he feared to walk and I can walk, look over his back in comfort. They also did not basically speak out regarding that statement. So for that reason alone, we know that the powers that be, the NCAA, University of Iowa, and their followers and their fan base has proceeded to not only with the actual current student athletes that have spoken out and the former ones that have been attacked, that although we also have the people that are coming out, as I said, I mentioned at the end, there are also several people that asked to remain anonymous name-wise, but not from an actual situation, simply because of the fact of the program that's created by Kirk Ferentz and they don't want to be harassed through the social media and so forth. So again, let's talk about what's going to happen prior to getting into this scenario from the school standpoint. Every school coach that goes through this process is going to try to, once these names are revealed, they're going to try to disparage the actual athlete. They're going to try to make statements about the mother, the father, the athlete, saying that they're just bitter and mad they didn't get playing time. And at any given time they could have left, no one was stopping them. Um, that's college athletics 101. The reality is every athlete that basically wants to play, especially at Division One football, are recruited on a couple things. Um, basically, if I come to play for you at that school, um, you're going to give me an opportunity to play at the next level. So basically, once you say that, everything that happens from that standpoint, you usually do what you're told. You don't ask any questions, no matter how bad or egregious the situation that it is. And now that we have from there. Now, once again, when a coach is in his 60s, he says that he's going to get a panel to talk about what it is he can do in a committee to make change. Um, this man has had 21 years to make change at the University of Iowa. And as I go further, we'll speak on that, not only him out of his own words, but also with the strength coach, Chris Doyle said, um, Hawkeyes don't change, the players change. So once again, trust the facts, not the process on that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so before the athletes or the parents are going to be uh, ridiculed and uh, made to be villains, let's talk about how college world works when it comes to some of these holy and thou universities starting with the coach like Kirk Ferentz. So for those of you that believe that University of Iowa is operating on a moral code that's higher than most, let me just explain to you that when these athletes were being recruited by the University of Iowa, that at no time during the recruiting process were their tattoos mentioned, that they can't have them. At no time were they mentioned that their braids needed to be cut. At no time was mentioned that their music could not be played and no time that anything pertaining to being an African-American athlete in today's society was an issue. So with that being said, the majority of athletes that we have spoken to and will continue to speak to pertaining to their recruiting status, which, again, no one wants to go up there and ask the questions to Mr. Ferenc at the University of Iowa 
how that these actual African-American athletes come to choose the University of Iowa. So let me give you a little insight. So when you're talking about before Kirk Ferentz or their fan base start to disparage these athletes and these families, some of the things that these parents were not aware of are during these recruitment process that involve drugs, sex, and alcohol. So for any um, major program in particular, or athlete that knows these things, when you go to a campus and your parents aren't around, a couple of things is going to happen when you go, especially if they want you to come there. The whole process to tell you what you want to hear, not what you need to know. I mentioned earlier nothing about the hair, the music, the braids, nothing. Um, so for that reason, that excuse me, for that reason, that all these things that happen when you have recruits is actually out there trying to persuade you to come to that school. What are they actually using in terms of what's to draw you to the actual University of Iowa? Well, I just mentioned again, drugs, sex, and alcohol. So when these recruits are given money by coaches to take these kids out to have a good time, these 16, 17, 18-year-old athletes, and basically when you say to have a good time, don't know exactly what that means. Again, you go from that whole process starting on Friday, get there on Saturday, then usually what happens is that the school either do a few things. The ones that they really want they'll invite you to the house specifically. They'll send the rest of the kids to breakfast individually. And at that time, they'll tell the parent, mother, father, I'm gonna take care of your son, I love him. He's gonna be great, part of the family, and that'll be that. And then usually they want to try to make you to verbally commit right from that standpoint. So again, this is the timeline that we're talking about right now pertaining to how these things actually work all the way down to the NLI. And again, for our University of Iowa, where the actual minority population isn't great, when you have a coach on staff, in particular, that um, is there to recruit these actual athletes to make the mom and the dad of the African-American athlete feel comfortable. And by doing that, when you have a coach that's there and you know that that coach is going to be leaving shortly and a parent asks you, is coach such and such going to be here still when, when my son signs? And the coach had, for rent says he will be here as less, unless he gets an actual higher offer, unless he gets promoted as such. So, for example, one particular coach who happened to be a actual defensive back coach who was doing all the recruiting for the African-American athletes and families sitting in the living room as such calling a family, telling them they were going to be there. When that question was addressed to the high character moral Kurt Ferentz, he said he would be there, that coach would be there unless he got a promotion. Come to find out that was not true. So again, we talk about the NLI, the National Letter of Intent, that one-way document that basically sets it up where once you as an athlete, as a signing day comes along, you sign that document. Once you sign it, that coach now takes a job elsewhere. You are now basically forced to be committed to the University of Iowa and remain there under that scholarship and under that pretense. That's one. So right now, let's recap. You basically recruiting athletes on drugs, sex, and alcohol, telling kids that literally that this guy will be here knowing he will not be there. And then at the same time saying that there are blind spots that you're not aware of. So let's talk about some of those blind spots. I'm going to mention things because at the end of the day, once again, these wasn't these questions that were asked by the University of Iowa or by the media base or by the media at large pertaining to the treatment of African-American athletes. And once again, for those people who haven't been a collegiate athlete at the high level, the rules of us that have know that there are going to be things that happen to us that are never going to come to the light of day based on how the structure used to be. And I, I emphasize used to. Uh, because at the end of the day, the things that go on with these athletes lead to um, depression, alcoholism, um, basically suicidal thoughts, all forced behind what we're talking about right now as the Hawkeye way. So, again, one question media, if you watch this video, you can ask Kirk for it. Um, weight gain. What dietitian or nutritionist that you have that basically if an athlete weighs, say, 170 pounds, that you feel like if you want him to be 180, that prior to him working out that day when he wakes up, that young man must drink shakes, Gatorades, 10 pounds worth, and then go to proceed to work out immediately after only to have that athlete vomit it all back out. So once again, if you, as an athlete, are underweight, as they say, and you are forced to drink five, six, seven pounds to gain weight and then work out directly when it comes to running, jumping, lifting, and vomit it out, you are not able to maintain that weight. What nutritionist 
a dietitian in the Hawkeye way said that's a way to basically get the athlete to buy in. How is that going to help that athlete become successful at the University of Iowa? Secondly, how come uh, is this protocol only used upon the African-American athlete? Why is it that Caucasian athletes who are also underweight were not a part of this actual treatment? Now, once again, for those that say that, you know, there's blind spots and this was Chris Doyle and this is what the players complained about. This is the microcosm that's going on in society right now, whether the chief of police whether you're talking about good apples or bad apples, as everybody keeps saying, all these um, good apples don't seem to be nowhere to be found when these bad apples are acting up. That is a way to shield. That is what they call plausible deniability. Um, again, when you talk about certain things that you can point to blame at somebody, somebody can step down, the issues at hand still exist. So again, that's one scenario. Let's take another scenario. So when an African-American athlete that came there with tattoos, came there with earrings, came there with dreads, when did that become a problem? Is the Hawkeye way only consistent of that the African-American athlete has to have the same hair as the Caucasian athlete? What is that protocol? What does that make the Hawkeye way so great? Another situation. So an athlete is falsely accused of something and arrested. In Iowa, the athlete explains that to Coach Ferenc. Coach Ferenc proceeds to rape that athlete, strip that athlete of any type of moral dignity that he ever had once he came there. That athlete, and you guys may know, and I'll mention at the end, almost lost his leg playing at the University of Iowa. And at the end of the day, when he basically explained to Coach Ferenc what was going on, he was so mentally and emotionally distraught that he actually had to bring his parent in to speak to him regarding those things. As time passed during his career at Iowa, everything between the entire coaching staff changed. Could not walk around campus without being belittled by the entire coaching staff. And to the sense when it came to game days, because he's no longer viable to the to, to the program because he got injured. And we talking about the next man up under the Hawkeye way. Where does it say in your scholarship that that young man, that young African-American man, because I'm kind of curious and want to know, where does it say that the black athlete must go in the basement and fold 700 T-shirts and cannot leave until he do so. What gives you the moral authority and character to belittle this African-American athlete who committed no crime, who was not disrespectful to you, only to be banished to the basement and told he can't leave until he folds 700 items of merchandise that obviously will be sold for the University of Iowa. Has any other Caucasian athlete been banished to the basement to fold 700 items each game, not being able to watch, participate, interact, or have proper relationship building with his current student athletes and friends that he went there with? So only to say that when you conduct yourself in this manner, you now have people who are screaming up and down about the transfer portal, about these athletes making commitments, having no idea how punitive, how disrespectful, how ignorant some of these practices that have been going on for 21 years under the blind spot of Kirk Ferentz, Chris Doyle, and now most recently, Brian Ferentz. The fact that Brian Ferentz in your press conference and Chris Doyle wasn't there, but three African-American, well, two African-American athletes, one kicker who was Caucasian to speak on things, but those same athletes can't speak on if they should be able to voice themselves or voice their opinion on Twitter or social media. That you, after 21 years in a blind spot, now says that's okay. You might think that because that kid was in a basement and being berated and called all types of names is why you didn't want these athletes to be speaking out publicly. For athletes that basically are basically, like I said, could barely stand and walk, that you was more concerned about what your image looked like more than their uh, well-being, health, and safety. Trust the facts, not the process. The fact that I am not a reporter and I'm literally, literally giving you the answers to the test to the media 
is these things is why that we are going to be moving forward to find out how much more of the Hawkeye way under Chris Doyle, Brian Ferentz, and Kirk Ferentz has done substantial damage to these athletes, mentally, emotionally, socially. Some of these young men, and by the admission of their parents, are not the same people that they are once they left. Now, again, what is the school and the coaches going to do when we reveal these names? Oh, this mom is mad. This kid is mad because they didn't make it. Maybe that's true. Has nothing to do with this. What is important is that why is Brian Ferentz, when Iowa gives a kid a hat, you asking the kid, are you about to go rob a gas station? Are you going to go rob a liquor store? If this young man was told these things and made him feel less than only to have his playing time reduced and cut where the blood, sweat and tears that he left on the field for the University of Iowa, as Kirk Ferentz makes four point five million dollars a year, is not able to mentally or physically be capable of performing the way he needs to. Because, again, he also, as an African-American athlete, was forced to drink these shakes at a certain amount of weight and time and then had to vomit it out. It's kind of hard to perform when your body's going through that type of trauma. Why is it that even with all these things that's going on with these athletes, that no parent and no athlete until current day under the current situation and the climate today, had they been willing and feel comfortable to speak out? Well, have you asked that question, media? Why haven't you asked the question about these blind spots? What is a blind spot? I've given you a couple examples already. And before I name the names at the end, I'm going to play a video so you can hear from the player's voice themselves. Now, where this goes, we don't know. But what we do know as of right now is that I, as an advocate of athlete, I, as a business that do things and to educate and empower the athletes and the family's best interests alone in the sports business, I, as an African-American man, if I had to be or make a decision, if I wanted to send my African-American son to the University of Iowa under this current coach's staff and the way they go about their business, I absolutely would not. When Kirk Ferentz says he was not aware, and as we go forward, when a parent asks about their son's relationship, about what's going on at the school, only to have Chris Doyle first tell the kid that it's the Hawkeye way or no way. We have never changed for a play and we never will. Has that statement ever been made to a Caucasian player? Curious to know. That's a good question. The same parent told by Kirk Ferentz, per Chris Doyle, per Chris Doyle, that this is the Hawkeye way. We would never change per player. So the argument that Kirk Ferentz, after 21 years, is not aware of what's going on in the University of Iowa and to tell the world that he only found out and knew once these players current and former spoke up about this. If the NCAA and if the powers that be in the media and, the, and, and, and all these coaches want to sit there and continue to lie through their teeth and think that these parents' voices will not be heard, this is how this business works. So this is for you athletes and parents, current, future, and former. Knowledge is power. And for that reason alone, if there wasn't any African-American athletes, as no different than what Roger Goodell said, in the National Football League, which is only 1,400, there would be no NFL. There would be no ESPN. There would be no NFL Network, no NFL Live, so forth. But for the 500,000 student athletes, as a Department of Education, if you will, refuses to have these parents or, or these coaches have to be responsible for telling the world that their student athletes were sexually abused. And that reason is because all these things that's been going on has always been kept in the dark and come to the light after the fact. Because the athlete and the parent never felt like they had a voice to be able to articulate, put things in perspective, and to be able to move things in a way where those same coaches that came in your living room told you that they love you and your family are the same ones kicking in your back and talking about you behind your back. They're the same ones that's giving you misdiagnoses about your injuries and then basically have you go to the NFL as damaged goods, basically disregarding the fact what happened at that actual university. We know this. We have the records. University of Iowa. Kirk Ferentz, are you aware 
about players having surgeries without parents knowing that they're having surgeries based off players not getting proper or second second um, opinions based on the surgeries that they got. Unaware they really were injured in the first place. What's your protocol for that? Is that only for African-American athletes or does that go across the board with Caucasian athletes as well? These are the questions that if the ESPN or the media of the world do not want to ask, there are some people out there and we'll find out how this goes because there are more people and more situations and more stories that will come out. But we do know that there are several athletes, despite whether they're in the National Football League or they back doing whatever. They are extremely scarred by their time at Iowa, playing under Kirk Ferentz, Chris Doyle, Brian Ferentz, and the fact that this man, when I asked the question, he apologized, said he don't think he apologized, but really don't feel like he need to. What's wrong with this actual industry today? As I said, 1,400 athletes in the NFL, African-American, 500,000 student athletes that literally these coaches are willing to volunteer, majority African-American athletes to go out during a bad pandemic and risk their, their lives in their future so this coach can be compensated. Now, with that being said, I'm going to read the names currently, and then I'm going to play a video for you all to hear from the voice of one of these names. And as I said before, uh, we have others, and I'm going to tell you how we're going to proceed going forward in that scenario. So the first athlete that is going to be on this list and, and parent, Reggie Spearman, Spearman and Belinda Spearman. We have Maurice Fleming Jr. and Rochelle Harper, mother. We have Malik Rucker and Charles Rucker, dad. We have Akram Wild Akram Wadley and Sharonda Phelps, mom. We have Marcellus Marcel Jolly. There are others that wanted to speak out and will continue to speak out as we move forward, but in fear of the media and the fans at the University of Iowa attacking their student athletes based on after what they saw when Kirk Ferentz took out or brought out three student athletes, they thought that was something that they did not want to subject themselves to or their stu former student athletes to at Iowa. So once again, we will still be moving forward on their statements and based off of that, but their names and further names may come out at a later date. For them, those that already spoken out that we will be reaching out to further to speak out or speak with, Emmanuel Rugaba, James Daniels, currently of the Chicago Bears, Terrence Pryor, Torn Young, Amani Hooker, Jaleel Don Johnson, Deontay Morrow, Christian Kirksey, and Matt Hankins. Now, again, that's what we're doing now. For Kirk Ferentz, Chris Doyle to deny any type of problems that they created for Brian Ferentz to not be at the actual media day or the press conference, for Kirk Ferentz to continue to maintain the current coaching staff, not understanding that those same coaches that are there now are part of the reason why the trauma is there. To try to put on a bright and, and, and smiley face with some current student athletes that we can move forward. It is amazing to me that these same universities these same uh, NCAA, which they are protected by, can literally say these players know how to speak for themselves and understand what racism and racism look like, but don't understand that their same parents who don't have any money, that if they got something for somebody, it would be an impermissible benefit, would not know what they to do with it. So you got to pick and choose. So at the end of the day, I'm going to play a video now of the words of Reggie Spearman former University of Iowa Hawkeye and how he felt about his time at Iowa. Well, I just hear him class of 2013. I'm playing at the moment, so I don't have a lot of time. I wanted to talk to you before 12. Um, came in as a freshman, everything went well. It's time to enough as coaches to play as a freshman. Um, going into my sophomore year, um, started 
as a true as a true sophomore. You know, everything went well halfway into the season. I suffered a really bad knee injury to the point where at practice I couldn't even stand on my own two feet. Um, you know, if that happened. I was fighting through it. You know, I wanted to be there for my teammates and stuff like that. So even though I could barely stand and walk sometimes to practice, and you know, I made every sacrifice I had to make to be there for my teammates. Later on down that season, we got a bye week. And this is, this is when everything changed. You know, the coaches, they love me. I was one of the guys. I was leadership to me. Um, everything was going great. Um, and it's like when you go to Iowa, you know, if you're a person of color, you know, you have a one strike rule. You know, and, you know, they, we know that. So um, one night, I went out, um, coming home on my moped. It was a dead night. It was a bye week. Um, my no bank didn't have a flag on, so I got pulled over. Um, police wants to arrest me. I told them I was nervous. I took a breathalyzer and then they handcuffed me, and I wasn't even drinking all night. So at this point, I'm, I'm terrified because I just got cuffed and I wasn't even intoxicated and stuff like that. So we go back to the station, you know, and tell the guy, like, hey, I can't do another breathalyzer because I haven't been drinking that much. He's like, hey, will you do a piss test? And I was like, all right, well, I'll do a piss test. Not knowing, unknowingly that the piss test wouldn't come back until three or four months after that. Um, I did that instead. So next morning, headlines all over, you know. I got arrested last night. Um, Coach bring into his office, and the whole narrative changed. I went from being this leader, this young guy who started as a sophomore, as this guy who's selfish, manipulative, who doesn't care about his teammates. Um, they stripped me of all of my accomplishments and roles I had on the team, um, and treat me like shit after that. Um, it was really bad. I'm doing the class on game days. It's been for two games on game days. They have me in the basement clothes and shirts for my teammates while I've been playing. I was very clear after that about the head coach to be on the team. Um, I kept telling them, you know, I was going to accuse, you know, fight it. And when it comes back, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be dropped. It's going to be dismissed. Um, which it has. I have that on file as well that I can send to you. Um, and come to find out later on, two months after the fact, that I was way under the limit and I shouldn't have never even been in, in custody at all. Um, yeah, and then uh, moving forward, you know, they treat me like shit after that. Um, during game days, they had me in the basement of this building folding t shirts. They told me I couldn't leave, so I folded about 700 t shirts. And uh, while my teammates are up there playing. Um, during the end of the season, you know, out there, like, not feeling welcome, after putting my body on line, and like, almost losing my knee out that season, you know, you know, I'll come back to Iowa. I you know, looked away to, you know, Coach Sands calls me to his office. So I'm like, okay, maybe we just wanted to talk about it before, going into the season. You know, he rips me to shreds, calls me manipulative, calls me liar, calls me names that I never thought that the guy that I could make for four years would ever call me in my life. It was disgusting. It made me cry to the point where I had to call my parents. I was so emotionally distraught. Um, uh, my dad came down just to talk to me because I was so sad. But this program that I just gave my all to that I almost lost my legs for basically didn't even want me anymore. Um, and then it was things that him questioning about my sexuality and stuff like that. And I was just like, listen, man, I can't even play football and help this team win. And it was very clear that, you know, they didn't want me. So, you know, that's a long story short, taking off on a fight right now. So I will get back to you as soon as possible. So, Kirk Fritz. Is it just African-American athletes that you question 
about their sexuality. Uh, Kirk Ferentz, is it just the African-American athletes that you call on types of names and talk to them and berate them and say that you had a blind spot? Um, Kirk Ferentz, is this basement that you speak of a blind spot that only African-Americans are banished to once they basically almost lose their leg and can no longer provide their bodies to build your program and make you money? Those are the questions that we're going to be asking. Those are the questions that the media should have asked. But like I said, in the meantime, under this current coaching staff, I, as a African-American sports business management advisor, manager, supporter, if I had a son and going to the University of Iowa based on the press conference that Kirk Ferentz just gave out the other day, my son would not see that university or that field. And until Kirk Ferentz, Chris Doyle, Brian Ferentz be able to answer these questions about these former Hawkeyes who gave everything to that place while no one is calling in talking about what can we do to help you because you so mentally distraught, as Mr. Spearman said, going through depression, alcohol, drinking, don't know what they're going to do in life now. All byproducts of the Hawkeye way. My name is Robert T. Green. I'm the CEO of Pre-Post Game, here to educate, empower, and protect the athletes in the family's best interests alone. Again, we will be speaking more on these things later. But again, we strongly suggest and ask that those that are there to protect the actual athlete, family's best interest, do your job.